G'day my friends. One reason I didn't do too many videos earlier this year before the cancer was that I wanted to address some more political and social issues from a Christian perspective. And there's one common topic about church-state relations that I wanted to talk about. One of the more misunderstood passages of scripture is the one about paying to Caesar and to God. That's in Matthew 22 verses 15 to 22. Let's read it. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you're a man of integrity and you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what's your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. Some Christians pray to get strong Christians in politics. Some Christians shudder at the idea of Christians in politics. Some Christians, and I'm one, have mixed feelings. You can't just say it's good to have Christian leaders, nor can you just say if they're in a Christian party, that's the main thing. But why should we even need to reflect on this question at all? There are two main reasons. First, many people, particularly non-Christians, not only don't want Christian political parties, but also reject the idea of Christian politicians altogether. Some even say that Christians should be let speak on social or political issues. They say, why let crazy people have a say? Others quote the passage we read and say, there must be absolute separation between religion and government. Haven't you heard that? The stupid thing, and I mean stupid, is that people who say this are dragging our world back toward what radical Christians fought against 400 years ago. They want us where only one set of views were permissible. In the 1600s, it was illegal to preach without a bishop's approval or anywhere except in an approved church. Any unapproved religious gathering of six or more people was forbidden under the Conventicle Act. Who wants that again? To prohibit public religion is automatically to make one religion dominant, and in our day that religion is secularism. Also, not only do many want to exclude religion from the marketplace, but also, as most of us will vote, we should be informed voters. We should have opinions and know where our votes are going and how to resist those who tell us how to vote. I won't tell you which party to vote for, but here are some principles to work by. Should Christians have no political role or influence? Don't accept scare tactics from those who would exclude Christians from political roles or influence. They say Parliament is clogged with Christians, or some bishop gives an opinion and they complain that the church controls Australian society, and they trot out, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. They say Australia has separation of church and state, so the church must shut up about politics. Actually, the US Constitution separates church and state, while the Australian Constitution doesn't. Ours prohibits the passing of laws that privilege a particular religion or denomination, and that's different. But even some Christians won't participate in politics in any way. Anabaptists won't join the army, serve on a jury, vote, or even stand for a local council. Some cults are similar. But what was the context of Jesus' teaching? The Pharisees tried to trap Jesus. They said, tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Think about this. The Pharisees were very religious. They asked Jesus, should a believer participate in a pagan society? They assumed that to participate in Roman society was to dishonour God. 
They think that believers should be like Anabaptists and refuse to cooperate with Roman laws. If Jesus says, don't participate, don't pay the taxes, then they would run to the Romans and say, oh, ah, do you know what Jesus said? He's teaching everyone to disobey the Romans. That would have been the end of Jesus. And if Jesus says you have to pay taxes, they'd take him and stone him straight away for making the Romans greater than God. Pretty nasty. Would we want to be like these Pharisees claiming that religious people should only participate in a religious society, that Christians can only function within the church and its activities but must stay out of the operations of unbelieving society? How does Jesus answer? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. He's clever. They only had to look at the coin to see who had issued it and who ultimately owned it. People understood that a coin belonged to the ruler who had minted it. So the ruler had a right to demand back some of what he had lent them. Whoever says I'm a Christian and I won't pay tax because taxation is theft doesn't believe Jesus or Paul. Both said to pay taxes. Jesus says it's not an either or situation. Both do your duty by Caesar and do your duty by God. Don't rush off to become a politician though. Are you gifted for it? We need more gifts and less narcissism in politics. What did James say? Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. It applies everywhere. If you take the role, you take the responsibility. In Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, Paul writes, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror to those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Another often misunderstood text. If the authorities are set up by God, it doesn't make them beyond criticism. A recent cartoon makes a theological point. One character says, I believe Trump was sent by God. The other says, did he run out of locusts? Absolutely everything in the entire creation is fallen and failure prone. No ruler is perfect. God created authorities because he made everything in the entire creation. They exist to provide order and to restrain wickedness. It's our duty to cooperate with the authorities to help achieve this. And this means active involvement when needed. Every Christian is called to active involvement. Pray for rulers, pay taxes, respect authorities and honour the honourable. These are political acts. Equally, resist unjust and unrighteous laws and actions. That's part of doing good to all people. Nothing in Romans 13 negates that responsibility. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John show how they were arrested and dragged before the Sanhedrin. The Jewish rulers, the highest court in the land, told them to stop preaching about Jesus and to stop healing in his name. Peter said, we must obey God rather than you. The Sanhedrin let them get away with this defiance. Throughout history, Christians have resisted injustice, defied unjust rulers and changed the world. These are political actions. God's kingdom is a political entity because it's about establishing justice, righteousness and love in the world. We are ambassadors of that kingdom. Christians defied the Conventicle Act. Whole congregations abandoned their churches to worship freely in fields and forests. Two Baptists, Thomas Helwes in 1612 and Roger Williams in 1644, wrote about religious freedom and the limits to the power of rulers. This is separation of church and state, 76 years before John Locke, the philosopher, thought about it. 
Christians resisted King Charles, leading to his defeat and execution. Christians formed unions and were transported to Australia for refusing to accept unjust conditions. Christians rallied against the Vietnam War. A Christian woman, Rosa Parks, defied segregation laws and triggered Martin Luther King's Montgomery bus boycott. We can and we must take political action when necessary. And they planned to close a local hospital. My old church joined the local preservation campaign and I moved a successful motion of no confidence against the government appointed committee. This was political action. It had to be done. We can confidently act for God's kingdom. Tell anyone who tries to stop us that they're just like the 16th century kings and bishops trying to impose their own beliefs on everybody. In a democracy, everyone has a right to a say. Anyway, if politicians listen to businesses which donate money to buy votes, why shouldn't they listen to churches who don't try to buy their vote? How's that undemocratic? Should there be Christian parties? Many say that there should be no Christian political parties such as Christian Democrats, Family First and so on. I agree. In fact, we should never vote for people just because they claim them to be Christians. But what about William Wilberforce in the British Parliament? When it came to anti-slavery, he did a great job establishing justice concerning slavery. But he was also very much against workers' rights and did a lot to maintain the power of the wealthy and the poverty of the poor. Richard Nixon had an aura of Christian respectability despite his nickname of Tricky Dicky. His presidency ended a shambles because of his vile, abusive and criminal behaviour. The US's most Christian president was Jimmy Carter, a clearly sincere man, but outmaneuvered when the Republicans hired Reagan to play the role of president and conspired with the Iranians to defeat him. Being Christian doesn't guarantee leadership skills. Look at Scott Morrison with his multiple secret ministries and the robo-debt scam. The atheist Julia Gillard had an excellent record in most areas. She got more legislation through than Howard and she and Rudd were among our most productive leaders. There are good leaders who are not close to God and there are lousy leaders who are close to God and calling your party Christian can't fix that. Furthermore, think of it this way. What if a politician speaks at Christian conferences or talks about faith but promotes policies which lead to poverty, division and death? Are people wrong to call him a hypocrite or say, if this is Christianity in action, I reject it? If one politician can give the gospel such a bad reputation, what if a party that claims to represent Christians does wrong? What does that do to the gospel? Here's where we Christians often make mistakes. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, Paul writes, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let's do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So we have to keep our focus on doing good to all people. When we vote for a Christian, regardless of party, we know we're still voting for that party's principles. Perhaps she will temper the party's policies according to a Christian conscience, but we know she may not be able to. But what about Christian parties? We expect the party to uphold Christian principles when in reality they too often merely follow the Conservatives, and that says to people Christians resist change. And where does voting for a Christian party stop being a mere vote for ourselves, for our own tribe, for our own good, in fact? Don't we seriously risk losing sight of doing good to all people? Also, Christian parties attract people who seek power by seeming pious. They play up the impression of being sincere religious people just to get a powerful position. As Lord Acton said, all power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. It's still true today. So to sum up, we Christians are called, we're duty bound, to work cooperatively with the powers and authorities and rulers of this world to do whatever we can to establish justice 
righteousness and peace in this world. These are the values of God's kingdom. We don't exist to impose rules and enforce compliance. We exist to declare what's right and to stand for principles even when the world ignores us. But it's up to our elected representatives to make the decisions and we only resist if what they decide is wrong. We participate in our society. We belong to God. We are in the world, but not of it. So why set up so-called Christian parties? Christians can and do participate in politics, but Christian political parties often just get the gospel a bad name. And never forget that if we change society by the power of law, the glory goes to the law. But if we change the world by the gospel's power, the glory goes to Christ our Lord. Let's make sure this is how it works out. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe using the button on the right. Got to write that time.